up this morning can honestly say I won't complain. It doesn't matter what you go through in this life. What matters is how do you perceive what you're going through. It's all about the filter that you're using. And I believe that if we have a heaven-born filter, then we won't complain. Is that all right, family? Amen. Before we uh, go to the word of God this morning, let us pause for a word of prayer. Shall we pray, family? Eternal Father of heaven and earth, I pray that your spirit will manifest itself just now. Lord, allow us to recognize what Jesus has accomplished through the Holy Spirit. Bless each and every one of us, I do pray in your son's holy name we ask. All things, let everyone say. Amen. Family, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Romans, the 8th chapter. I want us to consider the first four verses. Romans, the 8th chapter, and verses 1 through 4. I, I know what you're thinking. We just read chapter 7. Uh, however, I would like to underscore that when Paul wrote Romans, he did not write chapters and verses. It was one continuous thought. Is that all right? About a thousand years ago, someone came up with a clever idea because man, uh, his, his, his attention span, his, his memory was shrinking. And so what they decided to do about a thousand years ago was to add chapters and verses for our convenience. And it's been a blessing ever since. What do you say, family? Romans, the eighth chapter, considering the first four verses, the Bible teaches us, it says, there is therefore now no what, everyone? To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has done what? Made me free from the law of sin and what else? For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in who? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Family, for the next few moments, I would like to dialogue with you on the topic, no condemnation. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines condemned as to declare to be reprehensible, wrong, or evil, usually after weighing evidence and without reservation. Flying airplanes into buildings on 9-11 was condemned as terroristic attacks. Proof for, I'm going to hold on while we talk in the church. Because I, I, I want us to get this. I want us to all be together. Is that all right? Police brutality on black and brown people has been condemned as racist. America no longer condemns homosexuality. Consequently, to speak out against same gender relations has been condemned as hate speech. Family, the church embraces what it wants condemned. Jewelry, makeup, and the theater. Condemnation is not endorsing what your God-given conscience tells you is wrong. We condemn murder, then murder people with our tongues. We condemn lying, but yet we 
live a lie. We criticize, denounce, attack, express our disapproval, and condemn sex before marriage, but we're still having it. Am I coming down your street yet? Condemnation is for the non-believer or the infidel. Condemnation is for Judas Iscariot because he betrayed Jesus. Condemnation is for Satan and this world because Christ reigns victorious. But there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Family, when the prophet Ezekiel wrote, he says, when the watchman warns the wicked and he does not turn from his wicked way, he is condemned. When the righteous is warned for his iniquity and doesn't repent, he is condemned. When you put forth your hand towards the plow and you're looking back, you are condemned. Lot's wife looked back and she was condemned. This world condemned Jesus. But 2,000 years ago, on Calvary's cross, Jesus condemned this world. It doesn't matter how good you are. There are going to be a lot of good folk busting hell wide open. Even though a person may attend church regularly, teach Sabbath school class, Sing in the choir, serve as a church musician, be a leader of youth, be a member of the pastor's council, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the jails and prisons, minister to the elderly, minister to the orphan, give an exciting testimony, dress properly and modestly, never use a vulgar word, never tell a dirty story, never drink an intoxicating liquor, never condemn the actions of others, never listen to nor spread gossip, never steal another's property, never take another's life, never speak disrespectfully of parents, be faithful to their companion, be a dependable employee, keep all their bills paid, never harbor any ill feelings, be called a brother and sister in Christ. Be a longtime member in the church and have a pleasing personality. They will still be condemned to hell unless they repent of their sins and seek the Lord's forgiveness. Amen. Family, there are only two ways to walk in this life. Either you walk after the flesh, or either you walk after the spirit. I wish I had a believer in here this morning. You see, when you walk after the flesh, you are walking after Satan. But when you're walking after the spirit, you're walking after Christ. Can somebody say amen? amen. I, I want us to understand that the Bible says that God allows the rain to fall on the who? Just. The just and the unjust. God allows the sun to shine on both the righteous and the unrighteous. Is that all right? Christ says that those that hear my words and build their house upon the solid rock are wise. And when the rains and the winds come, the house cannot fall because it's built upon the solid rock. Amen. I'm here to tell you that I'd rather fall on the rock rather than the rock falling on me. Amen. Christ goes on to say, those that hear my words and do them not are 
and the narrow, there's holiness, there's righteousness, there's goodness, and there's eternal life down on the narrow path. So where are you walking this morning, family? Even Christ condemns the foolish. Didn't he call five virgins foolish? Oh, you're not hearing me this morning. You see, there are some folk in the church right now. We're all in here and we all love the Lord. All of us in here are attracted to the truth. But there are some of us up in here today, although we are attracted to the truth, we have a problem living the truth. Are you with me now? You see, we all got an issue. There are only two natures at play in this world. There's the flesh that is at play, and there's the spirit that is, that is at play. And there's only one way we can walk. Even Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. You can't be in Christ and in Satan at the same time. Either you're going to love one more than the other and you're going to follow him. So how are we walking today? We need to change the way we walk. Is that all right? Can I just be honest with us? Some of us in the church ain't churchified yet. Are you hearing me? Some of us are in here for show. Some of us, we have, we have got it down pat, Brother Darrell, how to jump through the hoop that is lit with fire. God is not impressed with our entertainment. God is not impressed with our double lives. Huh? Come on now, can we just be real? We know that some folk in the church ain't going to glory. Uh, is, is, was that a public service announcement? Because some of us, you all seen that movie Life, where the baseball player, his name was Can't Get Right. Some of us in the church can't get right. But I'm going to help you. Because Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So in other words, if you're going through a trial, if you're going through a situation, you can overcome. I, I want you to understand this now. Is, is temptation a sin? No temptation is not a sin. The Bible declares that Jesus was tempted of the devil yet without sin. So when sins come, when sin comes your way and sin knocks on your door, you ain't got, I know that's not good English, but you ain't got no business opening up the door and allowing sin to walk on in your home. Are you hearing me this morning? So if sin is over here, then Alex is going over there. Is that all right? You see, but sometimes we get caught up in the old man because we have not learned how to crucify the old man. I know some of y'all think, well, I got this thing together. Let somebody cut you off in traffic, and I'm going to see how holy you are. Let somebody lay a hand on your child, and I'm going to see how holy you are. Can I just be real? Because I got to work out this thing too called salvation. Just the other day, my son and his friend, they were at a program, and a grown man cursed at them. Oh, heaven help us. Y'all know I ain't all the way sanctified just yet. I still got a little South Central Los Angeles in me, but I got to crucify that thing because I said, I got to see this man. You see, and some of us, we got to take time to process in our mind. If we let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, you and I got to change the narrative that we rehearse in our minds. So you have come to understand that I should not allow anything on the outside 
to influence what's on the inside. I want you to get this now. The devil can't make you sin. All the devil can do is put things in front of you on the outside, but it is the inner man of the spirit of Jesus that's on the inside. You know, when I was a little boy, I used to watch cartoons. I loved me some cartoons when I was a kid. And when I was a kid, the cartoons would often have an angel on your shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder. And both of them are trying to get you to do what they're telling you to do. Satan will give you all the enticements. Are you hearing me? If you want money, Satan will give you money. Huh? Is that all right? If, if, if you want a beautiful woman, Satan will give you a beautiful woman. If you want a man that's, that's, that's caramel brown, light eyes, smooth lips and, and, and has a nice chiseled body, uh, the devil will give them to you. <laughs> kind of sounds like Pastor Williams in that narrative. <laughs> but both sides are warring for the mind. We read in our scripture reading. Turn, turn, turn to uh, Romans 7, 23. Romans 7, 23. Look at this scripture here. Romans, the seventh chapter, the 23, 23rd verse. You have it, amen? Look at what the word of God says. It says, but I see another what? In my members. Talking about the body now, amen? Warring against the law where? Of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. There is a struggle, us brothers and sisters, right now. Your flesh and your mind, what's on the outside. See, your flesh is attracted to that woman. Can we be honest? Your flesh is attracted to that brother. Your flesh is attracted to the food. Your flesh is attracted to the drink. Your flesh is attracted to the good life. But your mind is warring against it. You ever heard when you were a little kid, always follow your first mind? I want you to get this now. Follow your first mind because your first mind will lead you in the right direction. But if you don't listen to your first mind, what happens is the voice of your first mind will grow weaker. And weaker and weaker until you fall into sin. There was a pilot. He was taken off. And as he was taken off, the tower signaled to him, turn around. You're going in the wrong direction. And he kept going. The tower signals again, turn around. You're going in the wrong direction. Sooner or later, the voice started getting, becoming more faint and faint and faint as he moved away from the tower. I, I want you to get this now, family. That pilot is you and I. That tower is the Holy Spirit. And the more we move away, the less we can hear the voice of God. So the mind and the body are at war with one another. And I'll share this. And I, I say this all the time. R&B singer R. Kelly wrote a song. My mind is telling me no. My body is telling me yes. Are y'all with me? If you allow your, your matter to rule your mind, you're going to always waddle in sin. We cannot afford to be mental midgets. We have to exercise our mind and feed our spirit. Stand up, Brother Jeremy. Turn around and face this audience. 
This man looks good, amen? He's off limits. He's getting married tomorrow. <laughs> now, this brother, he, he got a couple of muscles, a little bit more than mine's. Yeah, he got a couple of muscles. Now, now, did you wake up with those muscles? Okay, now, he woke up with them, okay. But now, when you were born, were you born with these muscles? So you had to exercise to gain these muscles. Okay, you, you all following me? He had to exercise in order to look like this. Is that all right? Now, the same rule applies to your spiritual life. The more you tell the devil no, the better you're going to look. Is that all right? Thank you, Brother Jeremy. The more you tell Satan no, the more you tell that girl no, the more you tell that guy no, the more you tell your homies no, the stronger you're going to get spiritually. In fact, the more you draw closer to God, the more spiritual you're going to get. And I promise you this, family, the more you start resisting, the Bible says resist the devil and he does what? The more you resist the devil, the more victorious your life is going to be. The better your walk in Christ is going to be. Are you all hearing me, family? I believe that this war that you and I are in, we're battling with two natures. All of us in here has a past. Some a little uh, tattered and soiled than others, but we all got a past. Nobody has the right to look down their nose at anyone in here. Amen. I don't care what your financial status is. I, I don't care what, what kind of church connection you got. Because I'm going to tell you right now, y'all think y'all clean. You give me some rubbing alcohol and a Q-tip, I'll put it on you, you ain't nothing but dirt. You ain't nothing but some good-looking dirt, some good-smelling dirt, some intelligent dirt, some sanctified dirt, but you still dirt. We all are in the same box, amen? We're all in the same boat. We all have sin. Come on now, somebody saying it back there. And amen, now that'll preach, that will preach, that will preach. So Jesus wants us not to be, uh, uh, he wants us to be wise and, and not foolish. And even Christ, he talks about uh, the rich fool. And, and the rich fool, you know the story. He has all of this accumulated masses and his barns are filled up. And he, he's talking about and thinking about what he has. And he decides that he's going to tear his barns down. And he erects some new barns. And once he fills his new barns with, with all of his goods and, and with all of his storehouses filled, he says, now, I'm going to take my rest and then have the good life. But he was unaware that that night God required his soul. So if you're rich in this life and not rich in the spirit of Christ, you are a fool. And you're condemned. I want you to know, family, as God views it, sin is always corrupt, never clean, ugly, never beautiful, repulsive, never attractive, costly, but never cheap, deceiving, never honest, black, Never white, and as God sees it, sin is always wrong and never right. But I, I praise God, I, I praise God that Paul begins uh, chapter 8 and verse 1. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because they walk not after the flesh, but they walk after the spirit, I want you to understand, family, that walk denotes, it connotates your lifestyle. Drinking is not how we walk in Christ. Being double-minded is not how we walk. Fulfilling the lust of our heart is not how we walk. So I'm asking the question, family, how are you walking today? You, when you live in the spirit, 
You walk different. You talk different. You look different. You act different. You dress different. You pray different. You praise different. We're different because the spirit is in us and we're walking not after the flesh nor the old man. You know, unfortunately, some of us enjoy sin a little too much. Is the world not filled with the street walker? Are the prisons not overpopulated? I, I, I want you to get this, family. As, as some think of sin as a disease. You, you've heard alcoholism is a disease. But if this is it, if this is the case, then this is the first disease that we have endeavored to spread rather than to confine and eliminate. Some of us think of sin as a sickness, but if it is, then this is the only sickness where the victims wish to remain sick rather than being healed. Some think of sin as a weakness, but if it is, then very few are wanting to become strong and overcome it. But anything that so ruins life, that so alienates us from the presence of God, that so removes joy from the heart, that so disturbs the, uh, the peace that passes all human understanding, that so separates us from all that really makes life worthwhile, should be treated as the indescribably horrible thing that it is. Nahum says, in the first chapter, what is it that you imagine against the Lord? Affliction will not rise the second time. In other words, family, when we get to heaven, there will be no more sin. Sin has been pronounced and condemned. Are you hearing me now? We all have sinned, but I believe by God's grace, we're going to make it. But how are we going to make it? We have to overcome sin. Are you hearing me? We have to divorce sin. We have to renounce sin. And we have to repent of our sin in order to make heaven our home. How many want to make heaven their home? Is that your, is that your desire, family? I don't know about you, but I can't think of anything that is better than heaven. I, I've seen a lot of evilness and wickedness in my day, but I'm thankful to God by the graces and mercies of Christ, you and I can make it. But how we're going to make it is based on our walk. Paul says that we can no longer walk after the flesh, but we have to walk after the spirit. Are you all with me this morning? I just want to say thank God for Jesus. Why should we thank God for Jesus? Because there has never been a battle that the Lord cannot win. Do I have a witness out there? There has never been a burden that the Lord could not live. There has never been a disease that Jesus could not heal. There has never been a heartache that Christ could not feel. There's never been a loneliness that the Lord could not comfort. And there's never been a darkness that Christ couldn't dispel. I, I, I want to say this in closing, family. There's nothing that you and I can do to earn heaven. Let me just, just put it at its most basic element. Your money ain't good enough. Your family name ain't clean enough. Your education ain't high enough. Your good looks ain't pretty enough. The only thing that you and I can do to make it to heaven is accept what Jesus 
has done on Calvary. I know what Oprah said, but there's only one way. Allah can't save you. Buddha can't save you. Krishna can't save you. And I don't even care what, what, what uh, Confucius says. So at this time in our lives, family, there's no condemnation to any of us that are in the spirit. Now, let me just say this here while I'm closing. Why come to church and bust hell wide open? C can I it does exactly, Elder. It doesn't make sense. Let me just be honest with you. If I got frustrated and left the Adventist church, I would stop going to church. There's no other church on the face of the planet that has a truth like we have, that has an understanding that we have, that can teach the word of God unadulterated like we can. I'm not going to be in church, sit on padded pew in air-conditioned facilities, and still go to hell. You saying something? You okay? There's no reason for us to be in here and still go to hell. Let me say this here. If I'm going to go to hell, it's not because I'm going to be in the church on Sabbath. If I go to hell, I'm going to hell first class. I'm going to hell with my smoking suit on. I'm going to hell with the gasoline suit on. Are you all hearing me? I'm, I'm, I'm going to hell up in the club. I'm going to hell drinking. I've never tasted wine. I'm going to hell sipping. I'm going to hell puffing. If you're going to go to hell, go to hell. Full first class. Do all the things that you can do. Whatever your heart desires. Lust after all the women or men you want. Go to hell that way. Go to hell first class. Don't go to hell tipping. Are you hearing me? Don't go to hell with your foot in the church. All you have to do, uh, uh, I'm just hypothetically, all you have to do is just give up that God. Heaven is yours. All you have to do is give up that girl, that late night creep, that late night call, those foggy windows in the car. That's all you have to do. Stop meeting up with the woman or the man that's not your spouse. Stop cheating on your taxes. Y'all cheat on your taxes? Oh, never mind. Don't answer that. Stop entertaining gossip. See, I'm, I'm going to say this here. Adventists, we're not going to hell because we kill, steal, and rob. We're going to hell because we blow up the phones on Sabbath. We, we're going to go to hell for the little stuff. But I want to encourage you. You know, when, when, when folk used to come to me and they try to gossip, I say, I just want to let you know that I'm going to tell the person what you just said. <laughs> and I promise you, they're going to close their mouth. You see, the Bible says, from such, turn away. You know, from such, you, you, are you all hearing me? Yeah. It's not in an exhaustive list, but when people ain't living right, you can't be around that. The, here's the thing. Elder, if, 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 if you're right and I'm wrong in the church and, and, and I'm sinning, but you hanging out with me, it lets me know that my sin ain't that bad because you're still hanging out with me. Woo. So we got to sever some relationships even in the church. I remember when I was a, 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 a young man, I, I went to my friend's house unannounced on a Sunday morning, and I, and I knocked on the door, you know, because he, he didn't answer his phone, so I was in the neighborhood. We didn't live that far. I'm knocking on the door. This is my church friend. And the door swung open, and there was a sister at the church in her pajamas. Are, are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? That moment on, I took a step back from him. Because I didn't want him to think that I was okay with that lifestyle. 
You see, because I was telling women, I told my wife this, sexually I'm off limits. You got to be a man. You got to man up in this Christian walk. You just can't do whatever. You got to believe what you're preaching, what you're reading, what you're understanding, and you got to live that thing. And when you do, God is glorified. Don't you want God to say, haven't you considered my servant Curtis? Not Job, but Curtis. Haven't you considered my servant Daryl? Haven't you considered my servant Jeremy? God wants to brag on you. God created us and then gave us a planet to rule over. And you mean we're going to stumble over some little stuff? I want to encourage us, family, that this Christian journey is not as hard as you think. All you have to do is say no to your will, just like Jesus. Not my will, but thy will be done. And I believe just as Jesus was strengthened, if you read Spirit of Prophecy, just as Jesus was strengthened from a heavenly messenger, God is going to strengthen you in the midst of your trial, in the midst of your turmoil, in the midst of your tribulation, in the midst of your temptation. There's power from on high to help you in every situation. The Bible says, I will not put on you more than you can handle. And that with every, not some, with every, not most, with every, not a few, but with every temptation will make a way of escape. So that you can bear it. So if you and I sin, it's because we decided not to go down the fire escape route. There's safety for all of us. And I, I, I look, I, I know sometimes I say certain things a lot, but I, I really want to impress upon your mind. Are you with me? Repetition deepens the impression. Are you hearing me? Two plus two is what? See, because that, that repetition got you in grade school. Amen? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Right, hear me now. Hear me now. John says, my beloved little children, these things I write unto you that you sin. In other words, the Bible writers expected us not to practice sin. Are you hearing me? This is the standard. It's not down here. We fall down and get up. Are you hearing me? Don't fall because she looks good. Don't fall because she made herself available. Are you with me? And I believe just as Jeremy has physical muscles, all of us are going to develop spiritual muscles. And when your spiritual muscles become increased, it gives you strength to overcome. And to say that, I'm going to say this and I'm going to shut up. I'm going to shut up. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever it is, it might be bleak, it might be dreary, it might be ugly, it might be difficult. But I want you to understand this. When you're going through a trial, God allows us to go through a trial. And if we don't complain, if we don't say let this cup pass, but if we drink the bitter cup, what's going to happen is God is going to strengthen you in the spirit. Hear me now, hear me now, watch this, watch this. Because when you go through something, it only prepares you for the next test. Are you hearing me? And if you can't pass the first test, you got to retake the test until you pass it. But God wants to be glorified. We have unfallen worlds watching us, and God is glorified when we overcome, when our spiritual muscles build, and when we give God glory with the sanctified life. We've been set aside for holy use. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. There's someone here today. You don't want to walk after the flesh, but you want to walk after the spirit. Just raise your hand right where you are. If you want to walk after the spirit, just raise your hand. God sees all the hands that are raised up. Amen, amen, amen. You may put your hands down. How many of you believe right now because you are in Christ, you are no longer condemned? If you believe that you're no longer condemned, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand right where you are. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. That means everything that you've done in the past is not condemned. Amen, somebody. You may put your hands down. Someone here today, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you've gone through, but you want prayer. 
so that you can make it, so that you continue your walk in the spirit. If that's you, just stand to your feet right now. If you want prayer for a continued relationship in Christ, just stand to your feet. I believe that God is going to bless you. I believe that God is going to do something for you like never before. Now, let me do this here. If you want special prayer, not ordinary, but extraordinary, extraordinary prayer, if you want special prayer, I'm going to invite you to come down right now. Whatever it is that you got on your heart, come right now. Whatever situation is perplexing you, come right now. If you have a family member, a relative, a co-worker, or even a neighbor, if you know that they're going through a challenge, come stand for them right now. You see, it's time for us. Connecting with people is not about you, it's about the person. So I, I did a couple of weeks of prayer for, for different uh, churches and, and schools uh, recently. And I got back home, I hadn't been home for a while. And I told my wife, I said to her, I said, hey, I, I don't see the next door neighbor's vehicle. Something's going on. He's here every night. Something's wrong. I said, ask his wife, what's going on? My wife contacted his wife. And he was in a tragic accident. He was in the hospital for weeks. Connecting with people. Connecting with people. I said, listen, told his wife. Where is he at? I want to go visit him. Connecting with people. It's not about you. It's about the person. This is my neighbor. And I said, you know what? He's injured. I'm going to take his trash. I'm done with the pastor. Handling trash. Because connecting with people is not about you. It's about the person. So I pulled that big heavy trash can out. And I willed it. It was heavy. His wife couldn't have lifted it. He was injured. He couldn't have lifted it. His older and small mother couldn't have lifted it. Not even my wife. It was super heavy. I take it out. I take it to the curb for the trash collector to come. And I willed the trash barrel back in to the side of his house. Started praying for this young man. You see, because he was going through something. Con talking about connecting now. I reached out to him. And he shared with me, he says, listen, Alex, he says, I believed in God, but I didn't want no part of God. I didn't want to live right. I wasn't trying to do right. But I appreciate this, that, and the third. When you minister to people, you connect with people. I was talking with him on Thursday night. We were outside to about midnight, and he shared with me with tears in his eyes. He says, Alex, whatever God wants from me, he has me now. All it takes is the smallest act of kindness to reach out, to visit, to pray, to do a little something that someone cannot do for themselves, and it makes a great difference. God wants to make a difference in your life. Will you let him today? Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If you open up your heart's door right now, Jesus says, I will come in and I'll sup with you. In other words, Jesus is going to break bread with you if you let him in. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We're getting ready to pray, but before we pray, Someone has a burden on their heart. Just raise your hand if you have a burden on your heart. Amen. God sees your hands. Amen. Amen. You may put your hands down. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. There's someone here. You have an unspoken prayer request. If that's you, just raise your hand. Amen. You may put your hands down. We're getting ready to pray, but before we pray, perhaps you've wandered out too far from the distant shore. Perhaps you've never made your calling and election sure. Perhaps you said to yourself, I, I, I need to get back 
closer to God. And if you desire to be closer to God, just raise your hand right where you are. If you just want to be closer, amen, amen, amen. You may put your hands down. There's someone here right before we pray. There's someone here today. Perhaps the Lord is impressing you to become a baptized member of Bethlehem, to be rebaptized. Maybe you've been baptized somewhere else. Maybe you were backsliding and you want to come back home like the prodigal son. You want to become a member of this church, maybe through transfer of membership or a profession of faith. If that's you, just raise your hand right where you are. Is there anyone today? Amen. Amen. God sees your hand. Amen. Is there another? God accepts little people too. God bless you. Is there one more? We're getting ready to pray, family. We're getting ready to pray. But as we, as we get ready to pray, we want to remember Brother McCluster is asking for special prayer for his brother Calvin, who's been diagnosed with cancer. The doctors have told him there is nothing else they can do. So he's asking for special prayer. Let me say this here. For Calvin... It's soul time. But I want you to understand this. God is able to heal. But if God so chooses that he does not heal, God is able to deliver. It's soul time for us. You and I may not make it to see next year. But we can make it to see eternity by accepting Christ's blood on Calvary. So I'm going to ask the elders if you would join with me and place your hands on Elder uh, Brother McCluster. We're going to pray for everyone here, but we also want to remember uh, Brother Calvin McCluster. Is that all right? Let us pray, family. Touch the hands with the person next to you. Let us pray. Our Father, our Lord, and our God, we come to you as humbly as we know how, knowing that we have sinful flesh, but yet we're walking after the Spirit. And so I pray, Father, that the Spirit will have and will be the dominating force in our lives. I pray that the Spirit will saturate us with goodness and mercy, I pray that the Spirit will deliver us from iniquity and unrighteousness. I pray that your Spirit, Lord, will guide us when we can't see our way. Help us to walk in faith and not by sight, knowing that there is no condemnation over us because we've chosen Christ. Lord, we pause for just a moment asking that you will be with Brother Calvin McCluster Lord, the doctors have given him up, but you have not. And we understand, Lord, that you are able to heal. You are able to mend. You are able to fix whatever's wrong. And you're also able to save. And so, Father, I pray that you will touch Brother McCluster's heart and his family as they go through this trying and very tumultuous ordeal. I'm praying, dear Lord, that you will be with the entire church body. We all have something to overcome. We all have a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And so, Father, I'm asking that you will touch us with the blood of Jesus, that we may be washed and our iniquities might be dried up and cleansed, dear Lord. I pray in a special way that you will remember our feebleness, our frailties, our weakness. Lord, strengthen us in the times of trouble. Help us not to turn to the left nor to the right unless you beckon us to do so. Lord, I pray that you will fortify us with your spirit 
that we might have spiritual strength from on high, that we might resist the devil and watch him flee. Father, it is at this time that we pray for our young people at Bethlehem, asking that you will be a covering over them, that you will be a hedge of protection around them, and that you will be with them to sustain them all the days of their lives. I pray, dear Lord, that as our faith increases, so will our good works. Lord, forgive us of our iniquities, our sins, and our transgressions. And I pray that all of us here will be blessed abundantly because we have chose, we have chosen, Lord, to follow after thee. Remember the McCluster family in a special way, dear Lord, and remember every family that is represented here, that when you come, we'll hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant.